ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to our last public lecture of this year. As we meanwhile all got more or less used to the pandemic, also this lecture today cannot take place at the Aula Magna of the university main building, but is through the internet again. I'm very grateful that so many of you participate and watch our guest of honor tonight, Vas Narasimhan, the CEO of Novartis. I'm handing now over the microphone to Professor Michael Skepman, the president of the University of Zurich. Please, Michael. Dear ladies and gentlemen in front of your screens at home, in your office or elsewhere around the world, a warm welcome to the public online lecture at the University of Zurich. In times of a global pandemic and hence difficult circumstances, I am very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Vas Narasimhan, the CEO of Novartis. We appreciate very much that you have found time to join us tonight. And I would like to thank Andreas Kellerhals and his team for the Europe, of the Europe Institute for making this event possible. The Europe Institute is one of the leading centers of expertise for European law and politics. The Institute organizes public lectures such as this one on a regular basis and on various topics from international politics and economics. For reasons of traditions, these lectures usually take place in the historic main hall of the University of Zurich, where Winston Churchill has spoken in 1946. At least, this is the case in non-pandemic times. <clears throat> Just now, it's a great pleasure to welcome tonight one of the global leaders in pharmaceuticals, which is a key industry in the development of a new vaccination. His career is truly impressive. Dr. Narasimhan became CEO of Novartis in 2018. As you know, Novartis is one of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies based in Basel, Switzerland. Novartis annual revenue amounted to almost $50 billion in 2019 and has more than 100,000 full-time employees worldwide. Dr. Narasimhan works for Novartis since 2005 before he acted as global head of drug development, as chief medical officer, and also as global head of development for Novartis vaccines, to mention just three of his more recent positions. Before joining Novartis, he worked for McKinsey, where he was a consultant from 2003 to 2005, and for the World Health Organization. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh and received his doctor of medicine from Harvard Medical School a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, and a bachelor's degree in biological science from the University of Chicago. Dr. Narasimhan's career is thus based on an excellent education at top-ranked universities. The University of Zurich was unfortunately none of them, but we are nevertheless among the global leaders in the field of life science. What is more, we are also quite successful in terms of life science knowledge transfer. In the last 15 years alone, over 100 spin-offs have been founded at the University of Zurich in the fields of biotech and medtech. As a president of the University of Zurich, I'm proud that Molecular Partners, a university spin-off founded in 2004, has teamed up a couple of weeks ago with Novartis to develop COVID-19 therapies. This is just one of several successful joint projects of Novartis and the University of Zurich. Since 2016, some of the most promising University of Zurich startups are receiving financial support from the University of Zurich Life Science Fund, which was established to support exceptional spin-offs in the initial phase. The UZH Life Science Fund is jointly financed by the UZH Foundation and the Novartis Venture Fund. The aim of this joint venture is to invest in visionary young companies in the life science, in particular biotechnology. The transfer results from basic scientific research into clinical practice is very costly and associated with high entrepreneurial skills. The UZH Life Science Fund accelerates this development and acts as a catalyzer 
for further fundraising. Indeed, the first companies that were supported by the fund were able to raise, on average, as much as 15 million Swiss francs from in institutional investors, and this within only 10 months after the support by the Life Science Fund. What is special with the Life Science Fund is that each contribution raised by the UZH Foundation is matched by the Novartis Venture Fund, increasing the impact one has through, through their donation. The UZH Life Science Fund has invested in five young companies so far. The first company supported, Qtis, is already treating patients with severe burns in clinical trials, while our latest investment, Eracal Therapeutics, after a successful seed funding run, is optimizing its drug candidate before testing it in humans. In addition to the Life Science Fund, Novartis currently supports interesting and challenging research projects at the University of Zurich. By the way, the University of Zurich has no less than currently 110 running research contracts with Novartis. And scientists at the University of Zurich and Novartis published more than 100,000 peer-reviewed articles since 2015. We look forward to collaborating with Novartis also in the future. Third-party funds such as the Novartis Venture Fund, but also Novartis-linked research funding like Free Innovation and others are very important for the further development in the life science. Without additional third-party funding, the international competitiveness of the University of Zurich in top-level research would no longer be guaranteed. Novartis it plays an important role in this regard. But now, Certainly everyone is eagerly waiting for the main speaker of this evening, Dr. Nara Siman, who is known for his approach of being responsible for a fully unbossed company, where the employees should feel comfortable on all different matters discussed. Not wearing a tie is also for me personally a small but visible step towards a more easy um, discussion amongst us. I'm very much looking forward to his speech, which has the title Leadership and Culture Management in Times of Crisis. I wish you all a very inspiring lecture and I'm very glad to pass on the words to Vas. Please Vas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's really my great honor to be speaking with all of you uh, this evening. I would have loved to have been in person at the University of Zurich, especially to give such an important lecture, one that uh, I've read about, as I, as I looked online, about the, the history of this lecture, and especially on a topic like forged in crisis and, and leadership in crisis, thinking about Churchill and the work Churchill did during World War II to truly teach us all what it means to, to lead in crisis. I'm also very pleased to hear about the tremendous collaborations that we have with the University of Zurich, and I'm hopeful that those collaborations uh, will, will continue. So I'll start with a story, and I'll start with a story on my own leadership journey and how that leadership journey ultimately led to where I stand today, uh, dealing with a COVID-19 crisis like all of us are on this webcast. The story starts in 2009, in April of 2009, when we got word at Novartis Vaccines, where I was then based in Boston, of an emerging virus in Mexico. At that point in time, I was tasked along with my colleagues to prepare a response to what would become the H1N1 swine flu pandemic. Over the coming months, we would be tasked with trying to develop multiple vaccines, scaling up for hundreds of millions of doses to provide to patients all around the world. We would run clinical trials faster than we've ever run them, scale up production than we ever had done in the past. I learned very quickly how to deal with senior US government policymakers, all the way up to the, the chief of staff of then President Obama, uh, pre the, in the White House, President uh, Obama. I think the story for me really was punctuated in October, where we were behind in delivering the vaccines. And we were called to Congress to testify, and I would become the first Novartis executive in our history, uh, history that dates back, as all of you know, over 200 years, to have to testify under oath to the US Congress on the delivery of vaccines. 
The day before I was slated to testify, I was in Washington, D.C., preparing to testify with a room full of lawyers and experts. Uh, and I got a call from my wife. And my wife told me she's going into labor with our second son. So I had to fly back to, the, uh, to Boston and be there for the birth of my son, then fly back to Washington, D.C., and testify in front of uh, the U.S. House Oversight Committee. Over the course of the coming months, it was, of course, a, a very challenging time. But ultimately, in that pandemic, nowhere near as serious as this pandemic, we were able to deliver uh, the vaccines the, the world needed. But that experience started me on a journey to try to become a student of leadership, a student of culture. What creates great organizations? What enables science-based organizations like Novartis or the University of Zurich to thrive? It took me to many leadership books that I, I try to share when, when I have the opportunity and tried to really understand what are the fundamental underpinnings of leadership in general, and perhaps even more important at this moment, leadership uh, in crisis. I found great uh, interest in studying the lives of leaders who have gone through crises. One of my favorite is Abraham Lincoln and how Abraham Lincoln managed the years before uh, the, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation and ultimately ending slavery in the United States. The, the patience and the resilience with which he showed how to navigate those times. Many leaders I think that we can learn from in our history. So as we sit here today in the face of a, of a global pandemic once again, where we're trapped at home, where are trapped or forced to be at home because of the various public health measures, where lives are disrupted all around us, economies are disrupted, businesses are disrupted. I think it's worth again reflecting on what are the fundamental underpinnings of, of leadership. And I've come to, to understand and through all of the, the books and I come down to a very simple framework. How do you lead yourself through these moments? And that probably is the most important element of the story. How do you lead your people and teams? And how do you lead the broader ecosystem if you're in a leadership role to try to galvanize a response to uh, challenges that the world faces? I'd like to start the journey though on the leading yourself principles and leading yourself becomes so important in moments like these because I believe very deeply in what the ancient texts even tell us going back to Aristotle or the Tao Te Ching. We know that in the end, if you can't lead yourself, it's very difficult to lead organizations. People sense authenticity and sense energy from the leader and that actually doesn't come about by accident. It comes about because of practices that leaders take on. And I think it's hard enough to maintain those practices when you're in a normal environment, but you're in an environment that's completely disrupted, working from home, not able to do the usual practices that you have, all the more reason you have to lean in and really reflect on how can you maintain your own energy. I learned a simple framework about 10 years ago as well. Focus on your mindset, your movement, your nutrition, and your recovery. And if you can focus on those four areas, that at least provides you the foundation to have the energy you need to give energy to your organization. Movement, of course, is the simple principles that our body wants to move, we know that. And if we, the more people move, whether it's a walk or run or exercise, the better their emotional and mental well-being. When it comes to nutrition, we know that eating for knowing why you eat and eating for performance versus eating for pleasure versus eating for anxiety, there are very different reasons why we eat, but becoming aware of your nutrition matters tremendously for, for leaders. When you think about recovery, probably the most underappreciated uh, part of the leadership journey, and we know more and more that recovery stepping away from the work which is even harder in this kind of disconnected environment, or simply the power of sleep. Sleep may be the ultimate leadership tool. I try to sleep more the, the more stressful uh, a crisis becomes because sleep is the ultimate rejuvenator. Sleep gives us the ability to emotionally reset to be able to take on difficult situations. And the fourth, and I think in the long run, the most important and what we try to teach with the Novartis leadership principles is mindfulness or the, the mental side of, of leadership. 
We know very well that self-aware leaders, leaders who are able to observe themselves, ob observe their own experience, observe their own thoughts, are better able to navigate difficult, difficult situations. And it becomes foundational. I myself try to practice meditation at least 20 minutes every day, knowing that that gives me perspective on how to tackle very difficult crises. And of course, you can find that mindfulness in many different uh, scenarios, whether it's walking in the mountains in a beautiful country like Switzerland, walking along the Rhine, as I often do here. But there's no question in my mind, it all starts with a foundation of leading yourself. And leading yourself takes investment, it takes practices. And when you're working from home in a disrupted way, it takes an active planning to be able to put those principles in place. Then we turn to leading a team and leading a team in a crisis. Now, certainly if you had told me in January that uh, over 100,000 associates at Novartis would be disrupted in how they work, all of our office-based staff around the world would be put at home, that we would still seamlessly deliver 70 billion doses of medicine to patients uh, around the world, I would have said it's impossible. And yet here we are in December and we've done it. And I think leading teams, there's a few important principles that the leadership textbooks tell us and that we ourselves experience at our company. First and foremost, the foundational part of the story is creating a sense of psychological security. The way we tried to do that at Novartis is to take an associate first approach, providing reassurance that we wouldn't make pandemic related restructurings. We invested very heavily in associate well being programs and associate mental health programs. But we knew that the foundation had to be creating that sense of well being and that sense of psychological security. Then that let us step in to our cultural framework that we try to roll out around the world inspired, curious, and unbossed. Now, inspired, why inspired? We know that, that human, human knowledge workers fundamentally want to feel a sense of purpose, a sense of autonomy, and a sense of mastery. Research dating back to the 1950s, but really dating back centuries, has taught us that these are the fundamental underpinnings of human motivation. And so to keep a workforce inspired, you have to keep answering the question, why? Why do we do this work? Why is it so important? I always tell our leaders, we have to answer the question why three to five times as much as we answer the question how or what. We need to keep our people inspired. And it's even harder through the screen. Through the screen, the, our people don't feel the empathy. They don't feel the energy. So you have to do even more to try to keep your workforce inspired. And that's been a big lesson, not one we have figured out, one we're constantly working on. How do we keep the level of connection to the purpose of Novartis to reimagine medicine, bring innovations to patients? How do we keep that connection very strong and alive? The second is creating a sense of curiosity and personal growth. How can you enable your people to continue to grow and feel like they're growing through uh, a disconnected environment? We invested very heavily in learning programs in our company. We've made Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, various university programs completely free to all of our associates as well as their family members to enable them to tap into their curiosity, tap into their personal growth, take maybe the extra time they have at home to hopefully grow and, and learn. And lastly is the what, what our colleagues mentioned before I started speaking, the unbossed story of, of Novartis and how we believe deeply that unbossed associates are the ones that can actually deliver uh, the innovations that we deliver for, for patients. This has been an interesting journey, I think, from a leadership uh, perspective, especially in this kind of crisis. As a leader, you're very disconnected from your organization. I'm a leader who uh, historically would travel to 20, 30, sometimes 40 countries in a year and here, I've not traveled at all since March. Most days, I'm in my home, in my son's bedroom, or my offices. And yet, somehow, I have to create clarity to the organization, not micromanage the organization with my own anxiety of wanting to know what's going on inside the company, and enable people to make decisions very quickly at the ground level. Because we, of course, have to react, especially early on in this pandemic, we had to react to a diverse, diverse set of circumstances. That's taken self-discipline on my side, self-discipline on our leadership's team side. 
But what we've learned is the most important part of our UNBOSS philosophy in this kind of crisis situation is creating a tremendous amount of clarity as to what are our goals, what are our expectations, making that clear to each level in the organization so then people can do their work and then stepping away, not letting your own anxiety then lead you to micromanage the organization. That's absolutely critical in this kind of situation. So our team certainly uh, have felt inspired. We look at our engagement scores. They continue to go up across the organization. Uh, we've been able to maintain, I think, a strong sense of cohesiveness and culture. But I would want to say that there has been tremendous challenges in this. We know that people feel more disconnected. We know that mental health issues are a big challenge for a more disconnected workforce. We know that onboarding new people is a, is a tremendous challenge in this uh, environment. Innovation teams can't work together and they're, and they're only working through the screen. I think Zoom fatigue is now a clinical term almost that everyone is, is well, well aware of. So navigating that, I think, will continue to be a big part of the journey for us in the coming months. Nonetheless, I think the cultural journey of Novartis to create the inspired, curious, unbossed uh, culture to create a sense of psychological security has helped our people navigate the, this crisis through, through the 2020. Now, the third part of the journey for me as a leading through this crisis, and I think for Novartis and trying to be, play its part, was how could we help support the global response? How could we help the global ecosystem respond to such a, such a crisis? Now, we undertook many activities. I'd say companies across our industry undertook many activities to, to really enable vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics to become available around the world. But there are a few big principles, I think, that are, are worth reflecting on. Actually, principles I even in my research saw that Churchill often talked about. The first is build broad alliances and collaborations. I think in the history of our industry, there have been few, if any, moments where we've had such broad collaborations across the, the industry to try to bring solutions for such a situation. The collaboration span uh, in independent self-forming collaborations of our R&D leaders, collaborations that were put together by the, uh, the Europeans as well as uh, the US National Institutes of Health. I co-chair an access collaboration with Bill Gates uh, that led the effort to ensure we had solid access principles to provide access to the vaccines, medicines and diagnostics as they were delivered. When you look at the scale of the collaboration that happened in the industry, you saw an exponential virus growth, but you also saw an exponential response in terms of literature publications rapidly growing to tens of thousands of publications on this virus. The number of clinical trials rapidly approaching 10,000 clinical trials, hundreds of vaccines, nearly a thousand different drug candidates in the clinic. So a truly exponential response, and that was made possible from a, the, the, the power of collaboration. And I think that's an interesting learning in crisis. In crisis, can you look at your competitor in the eye and suddenly see the opportunities to collaborate in the pre-competitive space to try to enable global public goods to be enabled for the world? The second learning, I think, is how do you navigate the complexity of the environment that we're in? I think six months ago, we didn't know uh, where we would be with respect to vaccines. Suddenly now we have two vaccines. We still don't have more than one really effective therapeutic. Things are shifting so quickly with respect to the business environment, supply chains. And how do you navigate as a leader through that complexity? I think about in these moments, you have to think about leadership a little bit like a game of Tetris, where you see the pieces falling and for your organization, as each piece falls, you have to make sense of that piece, put that piece into place, and yet be ready for the next piece to come. Not provide a false sense of security or certainty, but rather be honest that we're all navigating and experimenting through a very difficult period. And we'll continue to navigate and look for opportunities. A beautiful example is the example of molecular partners, where we initially have not gotten involved in antibody therapeutics, and yet with Molecular Partners at Offshoot of the University of Zurich, we saw an extraordinary company that has the ability to come up with a solution that could be broadly available to treat COVID. And this became an opportunity for us. And so we took that opportunity. I'm convinced new opportunities will arise, other opportunities will close. But navigating through a crisis involves that mindset 
of experimentation in complexity. And that's, I think, very difficult for leaders to grasp. We want certainty. I sit in many, many conference calls where people want answers as to when the pandemic all will end or when a therapeutic will be available. And of course, the, the reality is that we don't know and we're gonna keep working through and science will evolve. I think the third interesting learning of this pandemic, and when you think about the level of leading uh, at the enterprise level, is having a new and, and re-strengthened conviction, maybe not new, re-strengthened conviction around the power of science. I think one of the more concerning trends you see right now is an assault on science because of social media, because of the expectations that are in the external world. But when you look at human progress over the last hundreds of years and the fact that so much of human progress is underpinned by tremendous progress in science, and you look at the response to this pandemic, this pandemic has been a story of the power of science, how we have been able to harness the understanding of RNA, of non-replicating vectors in the case of other vaccine candidates, harness the ability to repurpose numerous medicines to, to treat COVID patients in the hospital uh, and in the ICU. This has been a story of the scientific enterprise of the world rising up and in fast in great faster speed than we've ever seen in our history come up with solutions. And I think now more than ever, leaders have to really stand behind the power of science and technology as underpinning human progress. Explain to the public better than we have in the past that science is messy, science has us putting forward hypotheses and rejecting those hypotheses, coming up with new hypotheses. But in that process, we keep making progress towards the goals that we have as, as, a, as a human human society. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity to regalvanize our confidence in, in the power of, of science. And I hope that leaders around the world will take that up because without that, I worry that the trust in science will start to be eroded because of the, some of the politics and challenges that, that we see. So taken together, leadership in crisis, in my view, is about leading yourself first and foremost, creating a culture in which your team can thrive uh, and really enable that team to feel inspired, curious, unbossed, psychologically secure and then navigating the complexity and collaborations that, uh, are, are, that really enable us to bring together the best minds to solve uh, very complex situations. It takes resilience, it takes uh, a spirit of learning, and of course, it's, it's never, never easy. I wanted to just close when I, when I reflect on the fact that we have uh, RNA vaccines and given the opportunity to speak at a university, I think it's just worth reflecting on a small story on RNA and the story of, of how this, the journey of RNA is enabling us today um, to, to have a response. I think as many of you know on, on this broadcast, when you go back billions and billions of years to the deep sea vents in the Pacific, we know that likely, or we don't know, we postulate that early life started in those deep sea vents probably by the formation of RNA. And over billions and billions of years of evolution from prokaryotes to eukaryotes to multicellular organisms, then the tremendous diversity of plant and animal life, RNA has been conserved. The DNA protein, RNA protein continuum has been remarkably, remarkably conserved. Then probably around the late 1800s, uh, Friedrich Mischler was able to first isolate what we think might have been in Basel, the uh, early remnants of RNA from, from the cell. Over the course of the 1900s, we understood RNA better and better. We understood RNA not just perhaps as a messenger between DNA and protein, but RNA as an enzyme, RNA as a modulator, RNA for carrying information through, through the cell. And today we sit in a world now where a global pandemic will once again possibly be ended by an RNA vaccine. And at the same time, a company like Novartis is taking RNA therapeutics for small interfering RNAs to tackle some of the most prevalent diseases on the planet. That to me is an extraordinary arc of, of science. It's an extraordinary arc of the complexity of human life, but it's the kind of story I think we have to inspire the public more and more with. 
to really for the public to understand the power of science, the power of our ability to harness science to tackle some of humanity's most pressing challenges. So th those are some perspectives on leadership in a crisis, certainly not perfect, certainly uh, a book in progress, uh, but I hope it provided some insights uh, and, and interesting information. I would love to have a conversation now for the remaining time uh, of the broadcast. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Vas, for this very inspirational uh, talk about leadership in time of, times of crisis. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm quite impressed, impressed by, by what you said, and I hope you have the, the time and the opportunity to talk about some of the issues you mentioned during our, our uh, question and answer session. But of course, also impressed by, by what you did so far. You know, if, if, if I compare what I did when I was 44 years old and what I knew in those days, and now you are 44 and you are to have been the CEO for Novartis now for two years already, it's, it looks to me you are sitting in a different train than, than I was and I'm, I'm, I'm still are, right? Congratulations, of course, to all that. And then I also realized that you have a, a great collection of, of degrees, and it was mentioned before by, by Michael, uh, of universities everybody else wishes to attend as well, right? At Harvard University, Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard Medical School, University of Chicago. And I found out the only missing real grade leading university in, in, in your degree collection is the University, Zurich of, uh, Univers the university of Zurich, right? And, and maybe you have to talk to Michael afterwards to see whether we can do something about that as, as well. So thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, I, I might maybe just start the question and answer session by a, a, a first question, uh, you know, dealing with what, what, what you mentioned, unbussing, you know, you, a, a, a company like you bought the Novartis. Uh, you know, you mentioned Novartis is, is, goes back about 200 years. It, it, it used to be a very traditional Swiss company with hierarchies and probably office spaces depending on how long you have been working for the company and, and cars you can use and all that. How in practice have you, have you done this, this, this unbossing at, at Novartis? How did this go? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. First, uh, it'd be interesting, I think, for many of the listeners to understand the, the basis for how companies uh, are, are traditionally organized. Uh, Frederick Taylor, a well-known industrialist in the 1920s, uh, was really trying to scale up uh, manufacturing, and it was, of course, a manufacturing-based uh, ecosystem then, and realized that the, the way to scale up manufacturing-based organizations was to treat humans like they were cogs in a system, so create detailed org charts, detailed KPIs, measure every single individual for the output that they make, um, and, gal and aggregate that up so that you might have a production of a car or another machine, et cetera. And that understanding of how to organize is what carried forward for decades, and rightfully so. As a chemistry company, fundamentally, Novartis is a dye company that became a chemistry company that became a medicines company. Um, it made sense for Novartis to also be organized in that way. But something transitioned in the last few decades, and that's that more and more of the output of large organizations like ours became innovation driven and became driven by knowledge workers. And in the world of knowledge workers, there's a different motivation. So-called carrots and sticks are not the way to motivate knowledge workers in the end. You have to pay people enough so that they feel well respected. But what really motivates knowledge workers, we learned, is a sense of autonomy mastery and purpose, beautifully uh, described by Daniel Pink and Drive. But I think that research, whether you look at the National Bureau of Economic Research, MIT, Stanford, uh, universities across Europe have replicated the findings again and again that this uh, are the, the basis for understanding human motivation. So given that, you know, that insp inspiration, in fact, maybe we're a little bit late to this, uh, this realization at Novartis, um, we decided to unboss the, the organization. And there's a few ways that we've done that. One is symbols. So we mentioned the ties. Symbols matter when you send, uh, when, you, when you're trying to develop a culture within the organization. So whether it's getting rid of ties, I'm wearing jeans, I wear jeans to the office uh, every day. Um, 
changing the special consideration for management versus uh, all the other associates, making sure that uh, people feel included uh, in, in the workspaces that they're in. I sit in open space. We all sit in open space here at the company. Symbols matter. So we took down a series of, of symbols around the organization to really make people feel like this is one organization and the hierarchies aren't, aren't what matters. The second, and I'd say probably one of the most important elements of our journey was an extensive leadership training program where we really tried to train leaders on what exactly what I talked about. How can you be a self-aware leader? How can you be an unbossing leader? How can you be an inspiring leader? How can you be a curious leader? Does not happen automatically. But by working with leaders on this, we started out with the first 200 leaders, next, now the next 500 leaders. Now we've expanded that to 5,000 leaders. Our goal is to eventually get to all 18,000 people leaders in the organization to enable them to understand these, these kind of principles of, of, of leadership, understand the pros, cons, but at least have, have a fa facility around that. The third element has been a lot of measurement. So we measure this uh, quite extensively. We do quarterly pulse surveys, typically of the 108,000 people at Novartis, we have about 75,000 responses. This provides us a rich data set on 18 questions, which are benchmarked with global companies to understand how are people experiencing the culture. The second survey, actually I just got the results for the last quarter just now, um, is upward feedback to every single leader in the company, which we are increasingly pro providing transparent, transparently. So leaders see how they impact the, the organization. We of course had a range of other, other programs. What's been interesting to me to see is that initially for the first year, there was a complete skepticism about this, a deep cynicism. What is this new CEO talking about all of this funny culture stuff and leadership stuff? By year two, there was started to be a deeper acceptance that maybe there was something here. Now, as I finish year three, it's almost a normal lingo, normal expectation in the organization. I hope in the coming years, it really becomes part of the DNA of, of Novartis. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Vaz. I would like to pick up on your carrots and sticks. As a university, you must sometimes make a choice between how much fundamental research are you carrying out versus, let's say, directional um, or applied research. So at the University of Zurich, the primary foundation is that we foster um, no strings attached fundamental research, which means that sometimes discoveries we make take very long or have a serendipity component. But on the other side, you mentioned and I mentioned molecular partners, which is exactly an offspring of this behavior. It was not directional research. It was really free um, um, basic research, letting people to do what they can best do best, namely research. So in 20 years, we always have the question, where will universities end their mandate and where industry will start their mandate? What's the interface you are envisaging between universities and companies that have a research focus like yours? I think there's a, a absolutely critical role in the long run that needs to be continued to be communicated to policymakers on the basic science role of, of universities. Uh, a company like ours is always going to be focused on very specific goals of identifying medicines for the diseases that, that we focus on. But so much of that no knowledge that ultimately enables us to do that work, whether in co partnership with co companies that are spun out of universities or in our own labs, uh, ultimately comes from the basic science um, work of, of universities. Um, my own view is that you know, in the in the U.S. with the NIH, that that is a very powerful tool to fund basic research. Europe needs to invest more in supporting the basic research in universities. Um, I think other countries now are examining this, the Japan are being, and being another one. China is certainly investing a lot now to support the basic sciences. Understanding that that basic science is what creates the ecosystem to then do translation into, in our world, medicines, but of course, translation into other industrial, in the industrial applications. At Novartis, we try to strike the balance and we are um, alongside Roche, probably the two companies that invest the most in basic science research in general in the sector there's been a movement out of basic science and much more trying to 
um, get science that's closer to human clinical trials and, and then in license that in. Uh, we believe that building strong internal know-how is incredibly important to evaluate external science. And also it allows us to have certain discoveries that we make in our, in our own lab. So I think we'll keep trying to strike that balance. But my, my bigger concern from a policy standpoint is how do we continue to support universities to do the most important basic science research, the kind of research that companies will, will never do. What, what would you say is the direct result of your new different management style in, in Novartis? Do, do people free, feel happier or, or freer or do they do, they do, do better research? Or will we soon see another Nobel Prize winner coming from Basel? I, ho I hope all of those things. Uh, what, I, what I hear from people is that uh, I mean, first, I should say we, we do this because we believe it'll drive better performance in the organization. Uh, when I when you look at our longest term shareholders, the shareholders who hold Novartis shares for decades, they mostly are interested in how the cultural transformation is going because they know that strong cultures are the underpinning of finding new drugs, being able to innovate in manufacturing or data science or digital technologies um, or, or wherever. And so I, I think that tells you something when the largest investors are, are asking the question of culture, because they know culture is ultimately what, what it will drive that, that long-term uh, performance. What we hear back right now is higher engagement levels. And we know more engaged associates tend to uh, work harder, are more productive, um, have better thoughts and, and have a bigger impact. So our, our engagement scores to give you the, the, the data, when I started as CEO, we were at 68 out of a score of 100, benchmarked against other uh, industries and pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical average is 70, best places to work is 80. Our last quarter data suggests we will be at 82 to 84. So we're now in those best places to work. So that, that probably hopefully will mean a more productive, engaged workforce. So that's what the data tells us. Anecdotally, you know, people say the company feels more human, uh, and the, that word human uh, resonates with me personally, but I think having a workforce that feels a, a greater sense of humanity is, I think, only going to help us uh, in the long run. But the real measure will be, in the end, do we innovate more medicines? Do we have better financial performance? Are we achieving our goals to build trust with society? And we have this long-term goal to be the most valued medicines company financially and by society. And ultimately the test of this whole culture journey will be, do we achieve that or not? Okay, thank you so much. Now we have already quite a long list of questions popping in. One is from a group of uh, EMBA students uh, of the University of Zurich. And uh, we are having Novartis as a very interesting case for best practice in digital transformation. We are interested in how the issue in US with Avexis influenced the leadership style on boss servant leadership and the culture within Novartis. Can you say something about that? Yeah, I, I think w one of the things we, we learned through some of the recent acquisitions, including um, Avexis, is you know, there, there is this business school question of do you need to fully integrate a, a new technology that's very nascent or do you leave it uh, leave it alone and one of the learnings i take away from the recent experiences we had in a few of these acquisitions is we need to integrate wherever it makes sense and only leave pockets that that really bring unique capabilities uh, that are standalone from the acquired company uh, we were in that instance too slow in uh, integrating quality regulatory development operations etc and if we had done that very early on in the process I think we, we could have mitigated some of the issues. In the end, these issues were declared by the regulator not to be um, material. But I still think it's a very interesting learning because it's, a, it's an example of a, of a polarity um, and uh, hopefully the business school students are learning about polarities. So one polarity is new technology companies or organizations needs to be kept completely separate from the main company. Otherwise, uh, the, the main company will kill the new ideas. The other polarity is everything should be completely integrated. Otherwise, you won't have the right culture. You won't have the right standards, et cetera. And of course, the answer is, in general, in the middle. And how do you find the best of these two polarities? 
I think in retrospect, we went too far on one polarity and we should have found a better middle ground. Thank you. There's another question coming. Will Novartis return to 100% office presence after the pandemic or will home office be established? So we announced a policy called a choice with responsibility uh, it's a few months ago that shifts the uh, decision making on whether or not to come into the office or not to, the, to our associates. So our associates can choose, inform their manager, but do so in a way that they ensure um, you know, that, that the goals are met for the company. So it's another example of empowering our people to make the, the, right, the right decisions. It's not relevant right now as our offices are, are um, closed or only open for you know, those you know, events where it's absolutely necessary to come into the office. But what I expect in the future, what all of our survey data would suggest is most people want to be in the office about 60 to 80% of the time. Initially, the numbers were quite low, much lower. I think very early on in the pandemic, there was this excitement about uh, being able to work from home all the time. That fades because people, of course, miss their colleagues, miss the human interaction. People get tired of doing everything through a screen. Uh, and so my expectation is most of our workforce around the world will still come in three to four days a week, probably closer to four is, is where the survey data is trending. What we did in our, also to support our people is we provided support for home office equipment and, and uh, further support. And we're trying to study with data to understand you know, which teams need to be in the office more, which teams in the office less. It's a very function specific and person specific topic and we're trying to get better understanding so we can give people some frameworks of how to think when they need to come in and, and when they don't. But we are providing flexibility going forward after the pandemic as well. Okay, thanks so much for that answer. There's another question who came in that uh, means from your point of view as a CEO who manages, manages and leads several thousands of young talents, what are the most important things young professionals should consider regarding their development in their career and personal life during these uh, times? Yeah, so a few a few perspectives. Um, one one is that I'm very taken. There was a, some great a, a great book uh, called Range uh, by an author named David Epstein, in which he talks about how in the current moment and perhaps in the in in the years the years and decades to come, having a a broad range of experiences is incredibly valuable and valuable and I believe very valuable to big companies like ours. So I think when I think about my own career, I had a, a range of experiences, I worked in public physician, worked in public health, and then some in consulting, then I was in strategy, then I went into drug R&D. Um, in some ways, I was lost, <laughs> basically going to different parts and different organizations. But in, in that journey, I learned a lot, and I grew a lot. And I think in retrospect, providing the range of experiences before focusing in is very valuable and continuing to think about building breath in yourself is, is gonna be more and more important in a highly complex world. The second learning I'd say, is that why I started with that story on, on the pandemic is there's a, an assumption I think many people make that you will learn the leadership skills needed to lead uh, in, in large organizations, just if you continue to fo focus on the work that you have and actually Technical competence and leadership competence are different things. And um, while we have very good systems at companies like Novartis and all companies to develop technical competence, leadership competence is something that we're trying to build up, but in general is underdeveloped in companies, I think. And developing leadership competence matters a lot because the journey to be able to lead hundreds of people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people is a very different journey than building deep technical comp competence in a given area of biology or chemistry or physics or, or I, uh, data science or whatever. Um, so really being aware of, of both of those tracks, I think is, is, is very important. And the third is serendipity is really the path, the true path that, it mostly, that all leaders go on. I, I had no idea I was gonna be a, a CEO. If you had asked me three and a half years ago, would you, do you think you'll be the CEO of Novartis? I would have said, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm an r and I'm a development head and, and I hopefully will be a half decent development head. Um, and so I think serendipity, and that's not a satisfying answer, 
but the reality is the world is incredibly complex and you have to trust in some way serendipity will take you on on the journey in, in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I read somewhere that some six years ago, Novartis decided to sell its vaccine division to Glaxo. Uh, do you think on the, you know, today's perspective, this was a bad management decision? Yeah, so no, I don't think it was a bad decision, but I am very passionate about vaccines. Um, one of the, one of the um, accolades I'm very proud of uh, is my work at Novartis Vaccines led to my election to, to the National Academy of Medicine in the United States, which is the highest um, accolade you can get in the world of medicine in, in the United States. So I'm very passionate about vaccines, vaccine biology, science, et cetera. So as somebody who worked in that division for, for many, many years, I was very sad to see it go. But the vaccines that I worked on and our teams worked on are doing very well in GlaxoSmithKline. GSK is the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, huge scale, huge capability. So it made sense to send those vaccines to an organization that could be, be very successful with them. Michael. So <clears throat> whilst we are deeply concerned about uh, what is usually called a generation corona, uh, Generation Corona is a, let's say, a student cohort which has the risk to get a negative attribute that they had to learn uh, and study remotely at home. So what would you recommend people that apply with Novartis, junior scientists that will apply at Novartis, to put forward as a positive argument to avoid to being labeled a Generation Corona educated person? What's the assets actually? they learn by having um, studied remotely? Well, I, I think there's a, there's a few elements, and I think it is a concern. Um, and I think first, it's a very human concern. I think the experience of university is so much around the human interaction and the spontaneity um, of, of being in a university environment. Uh, so first, I'd want to acknowledge that I certainly feel the the uh, frustration, I'm sure, for many of the students who have to, to learn, learn from home. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there should be any reason, though, that should be a hindrance for uh, an individual to provide an absolutely compelling argument for why they should be brought onto Novartis or, or any other company. I think having been able to learn through the pandemic demonstrates tremendous resilience. I mean, this is not, it is not easy. I watched, I watched my 10 year old and 12 year old when the school shut down in Basel were studying from home. I mean, this is uh, not an easy process for, for the parents or the, or the children in that instance, but certainly as university students to maintain a high level of performance um, and, and learning shows tremendous resilience. I would also argue a tremendous amount of self-discipline because when you're in the environment of learning virtually, you have to have a tremendous amount of initiative in yourself. And I think that's, that's a very powerful, powerful characteristic. I would say the other part of the story, and I haven't thought this through because I've, I haven't had this question before, but you know, in the future, Novartis is gonna be far more virtual. I mean, the pandemic has fundamentally changed how work happens. Um, and more, more of the interactions and meetings that used to be face-to-face -face involving lots of travel will be virtual now moving ahead. And so I think a virtually enabled education probably enables individuals to navigate that environment much more comfortably than individuals who have many, many years of uh, ingrained, ingrained behaviors in a, in a different way. So I think all of those reasons, but I don't think there should be any, any reason why this should be a hindrance to, to join a company like ours. There's another question uh, that came in, um, focusing mostly on your experience in Switzerland, right? Since you worked in the US and now in Switzerland, can you tell us something about the cultural characteristics of these two countries? <laughs> experience. Oh, so that's, that's a loaded question. Um, so, I, <laughs> you know, I think, I think what, what, I, what I would admire, I truly admire about, about Switzerland is the ability of the country to maintain a policy environment that is just extremely sensible. I mean, I think the, the process by which the referendums, but then the federal council process these referendums, I think the approach to collaboration and consensus building, even amongst groups that are very different, just the fact the federal council has so many different parties 
and yet they find ways to keep the policy environment moving ahead. I think is remarkable and many countries can learn, learn from that because it shows you you can have very different perspectives on a range of matters, policy, business, et cetera, and yet still have the ability to have conversations to come to rational solutions. And so I think that, that has been a struggle of late with the polarization in the US. Uh, I think Switzerland um, is quite remarkable in its ability to find a path forward to keep advancing society um, society here. So I genuinely have a, have a affection and, and have been impressed by that in my time here. Do you think that Corona at the end of the day makes it more difficult for places like Switzerland to compete on an international you know, platform or level you know, to keep, let, let's say, to keep Novartis or Rush in Basel, or is there a tendency that that sooner or later, you know, we might, as a country, might lose those companies and that they uh, go and have uh, working places uh, somewhere else? I think I don't know if Corona shifts anything per se that I can I can uh, I can think of. I, I think that in general, the policy environment here has remained stable. And I think as long as that environment continues to be the way it is, you know, sitting here on the, I mean, Novartis has sat on the banks of the Rhine since, uh, you know, R Rudolf Geige started the dye factory in the 1700s. So, I mean, we've been here and we're not planning on going <laughs> anywhere. But I, I do think it's important that the, pop, that the populace understands that the policy environment matters. I think the recent vote on the Responsible Business Initiative was a positive example in the end, but it was a, a very close vote. And it was a initiative, while I think very, um, very well-intentioned, one that we support the spirit of. In practice, I think all large companies in Switzerland found it very problematic. And that's just one symbol of, I think, the possibility of creating an environment that makes it less attractive for large companies to be here. So it's a constant process to ensure the policy environment is competitive for companies like Roche, Novartis, Nestle, ABB, et cetera, to, to want to continue to be based here. On the flip side, though, the, the stability, the talent, uh, the centrality, the ability to, to do work is, is extraordinary. So I think there has to just be a constant gardening of that environment. Okay, thank you very much. Now there is another question coming from a student. How do you measure engagement? <laughs> so we have these, uh, that's a good question. We have these uh, survey instruments and we work with a, with a company um, and they, they do these surveys for um, companies, companies all around, the, all around the world. And there's a standardized set of questions you ask uh, your, your, your people. We have about, in our survey, we have about 18 questions. And those questions then are aggregated up for a quote unquote uh, engagement score. I don't know the details of how the algorithm, uh, algorithm works. I think it's to the extent we can measure these things is, is a reasonably validated metric that you can compare um, across companies. It, it measures, measures things of like, would you recommend this place to work? Do you feel supported in your role? You know, how, how connected do you feel to the purpose of the company? So there's a series of questions that then get normalized and then we can, we can generate um, an engagement score. Uh, I think the, the whole work of measuring culture is an area that's underdeveloped though, I would say. So there's a great university effort to do that. I think it would be well received. We ourselves are working very hard to try to generate a lot of data to improve how culture is measured inside of organizations. So that's on a different, that's on a different topic. If you hypothesize that the fate of a large company is continual development versus all startups are responsible for disruption, isn't it then in the interest of a large company to be close to a startup, strong startup um, ecosystem in order to, to make sure they buy disruption by taking over small companies versus having the own capability of being disruptive internally? Yeah, so th this is a very hot topic in, the, in our industry. It's been for, for many, many years. And I, and I think there's no one who has the, the perfect answer between 
how much do you invest in internal research and try to encourage your research teams to come up with truly disruptive innovations, even if they completely disrupt your current model of doing things? And how much do you need to buy that technology in? Um, Novartis, as an example, we're about 65% of the medicines that we have uh, out in patients today are internally developed, about 35% are externally. There are some companies in our, our sector that have stopped all internal research and only buy from the startup ecosystem. So there's, an, I think, an ongoing experiment happening right now to try to decide which of these strategies is going to be um, the, the, the better one. Uh, and it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, we have, we have the Novartis Venture Fund. We have our center in Cambridge and in Boston. We try to stay very close to the tech ecosystem. And yet we still invest about $2.7 billion a year in our own internal research enterprise to try to ensure that we disrupt ourselves. So we, 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 we try to try to strike, strike the right balance. I would say that um, there is an explosion in biotech right now that's happened over the last couple of years with, I think, 500 companies in Boston, hundreds of companies uh, in, in San Francisco, hundreds of companies in Shanghai. There's many ecosystems in, in Europe as well. Um, and so that, uh, that puts more pressure on the system to then be much closer to these startup companies. There's another question from a, a, a viewer uh, out there who said, um, you mentioned um, twice that you start to see the fatigue of employees doing everything in front of the screen or with Zoom. What is your company taking? to change that. Do you have a medicine for that? I have it too. I'm also super fatigued from being in front of the screen. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. I have to say it, it's, uh, it's been, a, it's been I, I, I stand like this as I stand in front of all of you and I'll, I will do town halls to 15,000 people at Novartis and I'll be doing it from my desk, which is, as I mentioned, in my son's, uh, son's bedroom because that's uh, the room we have available. My my, my off my wife has the home office at, at home. She's high rank at me at home. So um, yeah, it's challenging. It, it is challenging. I mean, we are trying to uh, encourage people to, uh, we, we have weeks off. So kind of uh, in August, we're going to do another one in January, where we just ask the organization to just take the week off and, and trying to give some forced leave. We've considered having days without meetings as some companies have done, uh, but that's very challenging for us as we operate in, in over 70 countries across time zones and a very globally complex organization. Hard to know which, which day to pick, but that's another strategy some, some are using. Uh, trying to encourage uh, calls where you don't need the video to keep the video off and just do a TC to give yourself a break from always being on, on screen. But, um, yeah, we don't, we don't have the magic so, so solution. And what we see in our data, uh, when we look at the metadata across our systems, is overall time online across uh, our organization is, is, is very high. It's going up. It's still, it still continues to increase. So people are more active on our various uh, technology channels um, at home than they would have been if they went to the office and then came back home. So we're still experimenting and try to fig trying to figure it out. Mm. Okay, there's another very practical uh, question about uh, sleep. How did you get enough sleep working for McKinsey? Since McKinsey consultants are notorious for working day and night. And how much uh, sleep do you need now? I assume you don't take any sleeping pills, right? <laughs> no, no, no. And, and you shouldn't because it can really disrupt uh, many, many parts of sleep unless, unless directed by a physician. Um, so I don't know, I think thinking back to the McKinsey days, uh, yeah, there were certainly long nights, but it, I would even say when I first joined Novartis, I was terrible about sleep. I mean, I would work, work really too long and not prioritize sleep. And it was only when I met uh, a coach that's been working with me for the last eight, nine years, who taught me about these principles of mindset, movement, nutrition, recovery, treat yourself like a corporate athlete. Uh, if you want to be your best as a leader, you have to take care of yourself. You can't uh, multiply energy of your teams or give energy unless you have energy. And that set me on a journey to try to improve my, my, my sleep habits. Um, today, I, I, sleep, I sleep eight hours a night. Um, I, I go to sleep at 9.30. I wake up at 5.30 and I go to the gym. So 
that is a, a very uh, consistent strategy that, that I've developed. Uh, when I was traveling a lot, it was often disrupted. And then my strategy was just to sleep as much as I could, whenever I could, any free moment I had to take a nap. Um, but, you know, sleep sleep uh, is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and one of the books I recently re recommended on LinkedIn is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, which is filled with lots of interesting data on the power of sleep. If you think about it, and this is the, the university side of me coming out, if, if, I, if, I, if you were to tell someone that evolution would conserve something that leaves uh, animals, all animals have sleep, almost they, they think many plant species ultimately conserve sleep, would conserve something that leaves an organism cataplectic and completely vulnerable to being eaten or injured, or, but still has conserved it for, let's, let's go to the Cambrian explosion, 700 million years, and it's completely conserved. This must be an incredibly powerful tool for evolution to have wanted to conserve it for all of that time. I still reflect on that. It's quite, quite incredible. Thank you so much. There are very different questions coming in. One is about the culture at Novartis compared to the culture in other pharmaceutical companies. Do you have an idea how, how Novartis culture is different from your rival competitor? Yeah, so I, I don't have a, a and I don't have a rich amount of information. I mean, like I said, we compare ourselves to the in these benchmark. We call it. We have this uh, survey tool called Glint. Uh, when we look at all of the benchmarks across the um, at least the pharma peer companies that also use the tools, um, we we find ourselves now to be above on all of the benchmarked questions. I think it's eight questions are complete are fully benchmarked. So on, on engagement, the score across the pharmaceutical industry is around 70, we're at 82. So that gives you a sense that uh, we certainly are scoring better. And that gives you at least some indicator that we're, we're headed in, in the right direction. Um, but for me, it doesn't really matter in a sense. I mean, what matters is that, that people who work here ultimately feel like they are incredibly valued that we brought them here to tell us what to do, not for us to tell them what to do. And we hope that they feel inspired and human enough to, to be able to, to do extraordinary things. And that's on the end what we hope for. Maybe a last question from my side, maybe but Michael might have another one then following. If I'm right on August 6, 2020, the US FDA criticized Novartis uh, quite heavily because of research data if I'm right, we're, we're somehow cheated, right? Uh, how much control do you have over, over, over you know, those, those, you know, daughter companies? Uh, what was your reaction to this criticism? Yeah, first, it's important to note the FDA also came out in uh, May of this year and acknowledged that we handled the situation uh, in the end appropriately once they completed their whole investigation and it did not impact anything with respect to the product. More than anything, it, it, the lesson there is, um, one, you can always have rogue scientists who decide to do problematic things. Um, and I think it's upon, a comment upon institutions, including us, to find those scientists and to remove them from the company and ensure that all of our data, because in the end, we're a company based on data and the data has to be of the highest, uh, highest integrity. So I think that's, that's one incredibly um, important lesson. The second is that margin for error for a company the size of Novartis, one of the largest companies in the world is very small. And in, in retrospect, we should recognize that any, any slip we make will be you know, put under a, a, a microscope. And in, in, in those situations, do we have to err even more on the side of the disclosure? And we do now. I mean, now any, any issue like that that happens anywhere in Novartis, we report it immediately to relevant regulators within five days. It's the most aggressive standard, at least to our understanding, um, in the company. So we, we, we plug the gap um, and, and we learn from it. Um, I do think as well, though, if I could just generalize your point, there's a beautiful book called Rigor Mortis on the challenge of replicability in science. And I think universities also have to challenge themselves that in a world where publication is everything, um, and if, if more than half in some instances of those publications can't be replicated, 
how important it, is it for us all together to ensure that we ensure the highest level of rigor in science? Because in the end, as I said, science is what enables human progress, but it has to be rigorous science that we all stand behind. So allow me as a geographer, a last question was, if Novartis would decide um, on a location, a new location of headquarters, where would you move? <laughs> oh, where would we move? Where would I like to move? Yeah, that's a that's <laughs> that where it's someplace warm. I don't know. I, I don't. I really have no. Uh, I have no immediate immediate thought, honestly. I mean, because we, you know, in the end, we we are in Basel. We're in New Jersey, New York City area. We're in Shanghai. We're in Singapore. We have centers in London. I mean, we have centers in every major city in the world. So, um, in a sense, I, I you know, I, I think we have the uh, the right global footprint and and the right and the right global global presence. But I'll think about it. I'll come back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I take you by the word, right, Diaz? Thank you very much. I think I'm afraid uh, uh, time is 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 up and. Um, I would like to thank you so much for your uh, sp speak, uh, speaking to us tonight uh, and sharing your uh, views on leadership uh, and management in times of crisis. Uh, what we have heard was very impressive and I think also quite different to what maybe most people before they heard you thought about management uh, in, in, in Novartis. We would love to welcome him back, and as uh, you almost promised us to come back, and we will uh, try to set up a, a lecture, you know, a live lecture, not in, through the internet, but live in our, in our Churchill uh, Aula. And I hope this, we can make that uh, happening uh, quite soon. So thank you very, very much indeed for being our guest tonight. Now, dear ladies and gentlemen, this was the last public uh, lecture for this year. Again, a special one through the internet. Um, I somehow like the old fashioned way in the, in the aula a, a, bit, a bit more, it's nicer. And you also get uh, served uh, food and drinks. We hope nevertheless that you liked this uh, um, lecture tonight. Uh, we wish you a wonderful Christmas time and hope to see you again in 2021. Good night, everybody. <laughs>